Yeah. I don't know if Dan if Danielle's on as well. She'll need to be elevated. Okay. The, there's Danielle in person. <laughs> Hi, Danielle. I just mentioned that you might be on Zoom and you popped up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi. I know it's got me reached. <laughs> So when do you think that you can be? Going through L.A. or San Francisco? Vegas. Vegas, okay. How big a group are you going to be? That's good. It's a long way from Vegas to Honolulu. Well, my brother's actually flying to Phoenix, and then Phoenix to Honolulu. Okay. So it was like, okay. Well, hey, Rick, come on in. Good morning. Also, uh, Kayla, uh, Khalil's going to be on Zoom this morning as well. Yes, okay, I'll move him up. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And Sherry doesn't like. <laughs> You know, we all could have just gotten up and slid over a chair, you know. I think you're I think you're taking I think you're taking lessons on the how to are twins today. I didn't get the black memo. All of you are black. What's with this? I'm blue. See, you guys got the blue memo, we got the black memo. Looks like looks like Rick you got Rick got the black memo too. And two of them were even wearing jeans. I mean like Oh well, what can I say? Oh I have jeans. The heat got jeans on too. We need to start working on our memos so we get this correct. I need to know what the uniform is. All right. Well, it is 9.05 on Tuesday, December the 2nd, and we are here for a meeting of the mitigation planning team, and uh, we have three members on Zoom uh, of the committee, uh, 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 Daniel Swallow, Khalil, and Joe Stormer. And uh, here in the room we have uh, Rick uh, Melendez and Robin Davis, our Chatham Marsh, Janelle Cornwell, and Ellen Lorraine McCabe. And in the audience we have uh, Nick Carter and Rick Quill. And uh, uh, Anne Marie will join us. She's finishing up another meeting and she'll join us when she can. So the first item on the agenda, first of all, thank you everyone for being here today. First item on the agenda is the uh, approval of the minutes from our last meeting of October the 6th. Uh, Kayla sent them out. Kayla, thank you very much for getting the minutes out. Uh, did anybody have any comments, corrections, additions, deletions to the minutes? Motion that approve. So hearing none, Chad has made a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Um, okay. Aye. Aye. Thank you. Then moving on to item C1 is Fragmites Control. Chatham, you want to tell us what's going on with Fragmites, please? It is now in a holding pattern. Um, everything's been sprayed, uh, hand sprayed, aero sprayed, as of we said last time. Um, it is dying in some areas, especially next to Rick's house. Um, so next step is April. Get Kenny and myself out there and start cutting it again. Okay. That'll be the next step. Okay. Now I noticed um, uh, I was driving up East Market Street the other day, and I noticed there was a bulldozer in there. Do you know what that was all about? No. Okay. Along the ditch, not on not on Rick's side, but on the other side. You probably saw it too, Rick. Yeah, I still. I believe it's still there. Okay. Well, no clue what it is. Okay. I just didn't know if that was something the. 
Denrec was doing or if that was a private contract. It seems like it's on open space land, so I just didn't know what the story was of it. No. Not a clue. Okay. It's about 100 feet tall. Yeah, it's, it's, in, it's, in, it's back in, but it's right next to one of the ditches. Right. Unless the, uh, unless the conservation company is coming in and doing something. Okay. I don't know. That's up. Austin could tell us that if he was here. Oh, all right. So I think that we ought to check out and see what that what's going on with that bulldozer, just so we know what's going on. Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you. I think what you have told us in the past, the spraying, the spraying seems to be pretty effective. Correct? Yes. And so, will there be a lot to cut in the spring? Will we be cutting the same areas? The same areas. We'll be cutting the same areas. And is there a burn plan for spring? I haven't discussed that with the um, tree, uh, state forest department yet. They're they're still out of the state. All right. Any questions for Chatham? All right. Well, then moving on to item C2 is a report from the Lewis Executive Committee on Resiliency. I think uh, everyone in the room is aware that the committee has continued to meet, um, and they will meet again uh, on the 14th. Uh, they've gone through a series of uh, presentations, and now they're beginning to get into discussion of specific items. I think the last meeting, uh, they evaluated, they weighted things according to priorities, uh, and uh, that seemed to be a pretty, dis from that then they had 14 different areas they had identified, and they narrowed that down to six items for them to consider. Um, and Janelle, would you like to make some comments? So they're, they're continuing to, to prioritize and focus on potential policies based on the six items. Um, the six items were um, off the top of my head. It was looking at open space in the subdivisions, overall landscaping, um, a resiliency fund, um, free board, lot coverage, and then a real estate disclosure. So they're looking at all of those and, and thinking of, you know, how can they best benefit um, and provide resiliency for the city. And the, they'll continue. They're only meeting once in December due to the holidays, and then they'll get back together early January to continue working on the items. That we continue. That is a, a very uh, good program that has been put together by both Denrec and uh, IPA, and so we're very fortunate to have been the recipient of that grant. And I think uh, that uh, the, everyone who's been appointed to that committee seems to be regularly attending and committing or, and contributing. Um, there have been some very good discussions. I think what the uh, how the highest rated uh, item was the idea of a real estate disclosure form. Um, being uh, and that was one, and then I think the second highest item uh, was uh, free board. I believe so. Yes. And uh, so those will be two items. But uh, at the meeting on the 14th, it's anticipated that there'll be more opportunity for the committee members to discuss th the results and uh, of what the, what's going on, or what how those uh, things were weighted, and and also look at other the other four the other remaining eight items that were not part of the the the, eight, the six that came up as being weighted. So it's an ongoing process. Uh, it looks as though this will probably this process will probably continue uh, into February by the time we uh, get around to making recommendations or the committee gets around to making recommendations. Khalil, you've been participating. Would you like to make comments? Yeah, I mean, you and Janelle covered a, a lot of it. I, I would only add that um, we are, you know, starting to get more specific about a resiliency plan. Um, I do think. Uh, you know, February is a date that, that's been put out there, but after doing some research recently, I mean, I, I, I'm aware of other communities that have taken a lot longer to develop a res resiliency plan for our communities. So I do think, uh, I don't want to, you know, I want to manage expectations for people because this is a pretty complex, ever-evolving process, whether we're talking about free board, resiliency fund, or perhaps even, you know, exploring more concrete mitigation plans like seawalls and things like that. So, I mean, there's a lot to digest here. And I just, 
I simply want to make sure that everyone knows that I think we have a terrific committee with a broad cross-section of people from dis different disciplines and that are really looking at things. So I just think that, you know, there's a lot to, lot to look at and in order to come up with a plan that fits Lewis, I actually happen to think it may take longer than February and others because there's just there's just a lot out there, and I, don't, and I don't feel like we have to rush into something just to have a plan. But um, I do find it the, the group to be very engaging and and diverse and in views, which I think is very very good. That we're having good robust de debate, um, but I do think. Um, it's an important issue and that we should get this right. And so I think uh, I just want to make sure that people know that we're going to be as diligent and as deliberate as possible in order to do the right thing for Lewis. Great. That's my view. Great. Thanks, Khalil. I, I, when I said February, I, I meant that perhaps the committee would have some recommendations and that is a recommended no, body. Yeah. And so I, I, I just think, you know, it's just not an easy issue. No, it isn't. And, and you know, Dan, Danielle does this for her living <laughs> in, in many ways. And, and I'm sure she can add that there's just ever evolving information out there. And, um, you know, we've just got to find the right fit for Lewis. Right. Okay. All right. Rick, uh, did you have a question, Nick? Yeah, but should I save it to the end? No, go ahead. Ask your question if it's related to that. Yeah, it's related to that. So, um. so uh, regarding uh, the Resiliency Committee. Um, just your name for the record. Yeah, just name and address Sorry. for the record. Uh, Nick Carter um, in 1510 Bay Avenue, Lewis Beach, mm -hmm. where I grew up. Um, regarding uh, the Resiliency Committee uh, and their studies and findings, uh, I think I just heard uh, from Janelle that the, they're prioritizing mm -hmm. six different items, and I, I saw subdivision, landscaping, free board, lot coverage, and real estate disclosure form. But my uh, question, I guess, and, and concern is the um, emergency um, proposal or emergency response to storm events. Mm -hmm. And if, if the town has an emergency response, a resiliency, rebuilding the dunes after we have a storm event. Um, I don't know if anybody's been on the beach lately, but there's about a, about a five to six foot cliff currently in front of the children's beach house. I'm aware of that. And, if, and, and there's no plan that I know of, uh, unless th there's a mystery plan that, that I'm not aware of, but I think the resiliency committee should focus I'm, I'm sorry, but should refocus on something that's that's more imminent, more uh, concerning uh, regarding the next storm, which could be next week or the week thereafter. Okay. You know, we can't wait till February to come up with an emergency plan to rebuild a dune that's been eroded. Uh, and I know Tony Pratt's making a proposal, Correct. and uh, I can talk about that later, but I think the Resiliency Committee should redirect their priorities to an emergency response to uh, shore and dune erosion. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Nick. Okay, alrighty. So let's, uh, and we will certainly call that the attention of the committee. Uh, the committee really is charged with looking at a more long-term thing, uh, you know, the situation, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't, and I think when we get to Tony's discussion, uh, we'll, we'll see, where, that's, a, that's a separate issue. I, it does, it's a very urgent issue and one that we're very cognizant of. I was out there right after the storm. I have spoken with Denrick about what their plan is, and at, their, at this point, at, when I spoke with them last, they did not have a plan other than shaving some of that to, and I think we, we talked about that, um, but they did not have a plan for beast nourishment at, this t at that time. Now, things may- Five-year plan. What it is. Well, I know it's a five-year plan, but I'm talking in response to the the, storm, the the current scarfing that you that you're referring to. They did not have an immediate plan for it, uh, but you know, again, that's something we'll get to in a minute here. I hope. All right, moving on then, uh, Danielle, you're getting ready for your big program with Rascal next week. You want to talk to us about that? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, yeah, Rascal has its annual summit next week. It's virtual again um, for the second year. Uh, this is actually our fifth annual. 
Rascal Summit, and it will be held over two days. Um, there's a total of three sessions. Um, December 7th um, at 2 o'clock, there is a panel, um, and uh, that one I think is focused on, well, the whole theme of the summit this year is funding, funding um, resilient infrastructure. And so we're, we're taking a look at like bringing in funders from the state and federal side and off asking them to offer specific advice on what makes proposals particularly competitive um, for their programs. So we're trying to get a little bit of that insider view to, to kind of exchange that with all of you in hopes that it helps in the future with future proposals. Um, so that's that, that panel on the 7th is, is focused on that. And then on the 8th, at 10.30, uh, we have a second panel that is featuring innovative funding strategies, including, I think, an interesting presentation on environmental impact uh, bonds. Um, and so I invite you to check that out. There's a couple of different presentations on that one uh, on innovative funding strategies. And then the third one um, in the afternoon at 3 o'clock focuses on uh, local success stories. Uh, so best practices that are going on around the state so we can learn from each other on, you know, who's doing what on, on resilience. And the, I'll put in the chat, the, uh, it's free registration and it's uh, at the Rascal website um, backslash summit. So I'll put that as D-E-Rascal, R-A-S-C-L dot org backslash summit. And you can go there for more information. Um, so... That's happening, and then I do have another kind of exciting update. Um, Rascal stood up this year a number of committees um, in our effort to continue to do, try to expand what we offer to all of you um, as a way of helping to continue to build capacity for resiliency in Delaware. And we're going to try out a new a new uh, program called the the Project Guidance Group, and. This is sort of akin to what you might imagine at a university setting like office hours, where we're gonna schedule time and allow um, the towns, if they wish, to schedule time to come and talk with a set of um, experts in state, government, nonprofit world, uh, university world, you know, that, that deal with resiliency. So if you have a particular issue like erosion, if you have um, a concern and you know maybe maybe you're stuck on a particular project and you're not sure how to proceed, maybe you just know there's an issue, you're not sure how to, how to go about it, you could come to this group for advice. And that's all it is, it's, it's advice, it's, it's not, rep, you know, if there's, it's not representing any, um, you know, any uh, official guidance, like coming from DENREC or coming from any one one arm of state government, but it's offering just some strategies. Oh, have you thought about talking to this expert? Um, maybe we can, you know, get you to partner with this person. Or do you know about this grant? Here's a, you know, we can maybe steer you or direct you in, in a certain way. And so um, we're, we have this out on the Rascal website under, um, resources and you can there's a very 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 simple application like a one pager um, where doing a first round of applications closing December 15th and it's to see what interest we get and then we'll schedule appointments um, and these are virtual and um, and then yeah we'll see how it goes you know we're trying to get a feel for what needs people have and how we can offer some ideas and um, strategies so I'll put that uh, in the chat as well if I'm able to. Or maybe it's the Q&A, or is that disabled? Uh, I don't know, Kayla, is our Q&A disabled? It's disabled. You're going to uh, enable it? it? Looks like it's OK. The chat's disabled, but the Q&A looks open. OK. OK, I'll, I'll just put it in there for everyone. Thanks. OK, great. Thank you very much. Uh, you want to you want to shed a light on local success stories, the third part of your Rascal Summit. You want to tease us with what you're going to be talking about? I think we have um, a pro projects from Newark and um, Coastal Resilience Design Studio, um, and I'm forgetting the third one. To be honest with you, I have to look back at it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I, yeah. I, you know, it's unfortunate that we're not able to meet in person because I think there's always a lot of give and take when we've had those in-person meetings at Dell Tech. 
uh, in Dover, but uh, this is the next best thing, and glad you're continuing on while you're, you know, in spite of our in inability to meet in person. So hopefully thanks. next year. Yeah, hopefully next year. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. Anyway. Um, Okay, so then the next item is a, uh, a, just a discussion and a, some feedback regarding or some information regarding the University of Delaware sponsored symposium uh, that involved uh, ambassadors from uh, four countries coming to the local campus. Uh, nothing has happened like that before. Uh, Danielle was a panelist with this group. Uh, and um, so, Danielle, I was asked to just make some comments. Uh, about what the current conditions are and what we're doing. It was a very interesting group of ambassadors. Uh, these are ambassadors to the US uh, from Portugal, Denmark, Croatia, and uh, Greece, uh, excuse me, Cyprus. And uh, interesting discussion about how they're dealing with sea level rise, but also a, a very, uh, I think, a lot of the discussion centered around on uh, the idea of how they're dealing with offshore wind and alternative sources of energy. Uh, most of these countries do not have fossil fuels available to them. And um, so I think there was, a, there was a lot of discussion about the offshore wind component. Danielle, you want to offer any insight? Um, you know, what I just took away was that, um, you know, in Europe, and in many ways, they're they're more advanced, especially on the renewable energy side. But also, really, in some respects, we're dealing with flood resilience in certain of the countries, and they want us to succeed. You know, and they they want to share uh, best practices with us, and they want us to succeed. And I would love someday if we could arrange, you know, cultural exchanges where, you know, members of our communities can go over and visit the Netherlands and, you know, and Italy and other places that have, are dealing with uh, a lot of climate change and, uh, and learn how they're adapting, um, what kind of infrastructure are they putting in place. Um, sometimes seeing, you know, can really be valuable, but that's my personal wish list. But I, I, I did enjoy the exchange, and that was the main thing I took away from it. Yeah. I think uh, the exchange was really very valuable. I think uh, what they, yeah, as you mentioned, they are way ahead of the U.S. in terms of their uh, re reacting to a sea level rise and alternative uh, sources or renewable energy sources. And uh, I think the ambassador from Denmark made some very uh, interesting comments about uh, how initially there were up frost, up, a lot of upfront costs that the state had to bear regarding getting uh, renewable energy going, and that particularly they're using a lot of wind, uh, and that the uh, that they're now reaping the benefits in a means of employment and in uh, re in uh, reduction in consumption of fossil fuels. So. Uh, there was uh, there was a real sense of interest, and I've had some outreach since then from one of the ambassadors uh, asking you know to come back at some point. So I think uh, uh, that would be a good opportunity for us to have a community sponsored workshop or you know event where we could have one of them come back and talk more in more in depth about what their their countries are doing. Uh, this was done in conjunction with a a whole uh, program that was put together by the university, and there were 12 ambassadors in total participating in the program. Eight of them went to the, the Newark campus, and the other four came here, and I understand there was a bit of competition as to who was coming here. <laughs> they all wanted to come here, but uh, it was, uh, they started with, uh, in the morning in, in Dover with the governor. Uh, in terms of uh, a, an overall view of Del the state of Delaware, and then they split up, and uh, four of them came here, and the others went up north. So I, I commend the university for uh, bringing something downstate, particularly that's so uh, acutely uh, sensitive to our situation. So I think it, I hope there'll be more of it. Um, and uh, thank you for your participation on the panel, um, and. Uh, you know, we'll see what happens next with that. Uh, Kayla, Kayla is, is Tony on yet? Yes, he's down at the bottom. Oh, there he is. Hey, Tony, I didn't see you. I just, I'm here. I've been listening. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, so we now uh, move then to uh, a topic of 
uh, of great interest to all of us, and, and as was mentioned by Nick Carter already, uh, how, uh, you know, what, what's our next strategy about getting to uh, some kind of addressing the this current status of our beach and a much more current uh, a crisis, if you will, uh, and Tony uh, has provided us a proposal. Uh, I would note that while we have this huge erosion issue here, uh, folks up the bay have similar issues. I don't know if anyone has been up to Slaughter Beach, uh, but in fact theirs is, in many cases, uh, far more advanced than ours is. Uh, and so I think uh, that storm that was a three Fridays ago uh, was a major hit for all of us uh, the way it came through. Although it didn't last long, it certainly did uh, a fair amount of, of damage. And it causes a great deal of concern about the safety of the, uh, of the homes and properties that are fronting on Lewis Beach. So Tony has obviously a vast experience uh, working in Denrec and, and, and consulting uh, throughout the country on uh, beach, uh, beach erosion and, and beach, uh, what can be done to stabilize the beach. And he uh, has been in the past a, a consultant to the Association of Coastal Towns, better known as ACT, uh, in, in helping us on a more broad-based uh, Delaware shoreline uh, uh, initiative and has helped us craft some letters to the governor uh, re regarding our immediate concerns about that. And uh, now he has been, he is working with individual uh, communities on specific concerns, and that's what led to this proposal. So Tony, uh, you want to talk to us a little, about your a little bit about your proposal and what you think we might be able to do here? Uh, yeah, Mayor, I'm happy to do that, and I, it occurs to me as I'm talking that I need to add another bullet point that I definitely need to go to Holland and Spain to consult with them as part of this exchange program. And, and so we'll talk a little bit about how we expand out to the Euro, the Euro vision on how we do work uh, to prevent uh, these st damaging storms. Uh, a little time in cheek there, but yes. we, if that's a possibility in the future, we definitely need to go there. Um, so I, I was called uh, right after the storm, I was contacted by a property owner on Lewis Beach. Um, uh, it was not Nick, it was somebody else, but that, that, not too far away from, from Nick's house on the beach. Uh, and, I, and I obviously have been a, a Lewis resident since 1975, I think I moved here. Uh, I've been involved in Denmark for 38 years dealing with the issues. Lewis Beach has been near and dear to my heart and I've watched it wax and wane with sand over many, many years. We were pretty successful in getting a project that initiated in 2005, I believe it was. Uh, not because I take that back, was it that, well, whatever. And what's happened is that there is, um, uh, if you've seen the proposal, I, I go into some detail about what is the causative nature of the loss of sand and maybe more significantly the one-way movement of sand from the west end of Lewis Beach toward the east end of Lewis Beach. Lewis Beach is what's called a bounded beach system. It's bounded on the left, on the, on the um, west side, the north side, however you want to look at it, by Roosevelt Inlet and a, and a jetty that secures that inlet uh, opening. It is bounded on the east or south side by the breakwater at the Lewis Ferry. And between that exists a, a section of beach which has three notably different behavioral patterns. Traditionally over time, the westernmost, northernmost section of Lewis Beach is the area from which sand is derived that moves in an easterly or southerly direction. Uh, it makes the middle section, the middle third, approximately third stable, and then comes to residence <clears throat> against the breakwater at the ferry terminal, which is designed specifically to keep sand from being carried into their uh, docking basin. The area immediately in, in the pilot point area immediately to the uh, west of or north of the ferry terminal is actually accreting it's growing by measured by surveyors that i have put out many years ago multiple times it grows at about 11 feet per year into delaware bay the midsection is relatively stable over time. There's some give and take, but it's relatively stable. And the westernmost or northernmost third has been traditionally the supply place of sand 
prior to the jetty being constructed and, and be, being um, uh, a much more protective feature back in the early 2000s. All that said, we have uh, addressed some of the problems in the past with the Corps of Engineers. Uh, the resident who contacted me asked we have a meeting, which I uh, held with several uh, uh, folks, in, including some of the folks on this call, and was asked to put together a proposal because as a retired Benrec, I'm now in the business of providing assistance to communities along these lines. So my proposal tries to get at two significant things. Uh, number one, immediate response, and as Nick alluded to, uh, an, uh, a stabilized uh, vision of, of storm response. Uh, when we have a crisis situation, the crisis right now is the uh, uh, increased erosion of those dunes either by another storm or the fact that they are a vertical face, they will eventually dry and slough off, as it's called. The top will fall down and create a, a bottom that's no longer a 90 degree or, or perpendicular slope. It will be uh, sloped back at about a 45 degree angle, made so by the sacrifice of the top of the dune. So where the top of the dune and the grass currently is, as a critical point, there will be additional loss over time if, if for no other reason, just from this past storm. The idea of putting some sand in front of that would be to keep that collapse from occurring and save, keeping the dune intact because that is the, the major line of defense. So the, the proposal I have would be to, to petition Denrec for immediate action more than just scraping sand off the beach and, and putting it up against the face of the dune that's kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul. Um, without getting into the physics too heavily. Uh, the sand that is in the bar, sandbar system in the dry beach and then into the dune, its protective nature is purely and simply frictional resistance that will dissipate wave energy between the open water and the buildings. Where it resides within those three components, the dune, the beach, and the, and the, and the uh, dunes, the dunes, the beach, and the, and the bar, it, 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 it matters to a degree, but, but if you take the sand off the beach and put it into the dune, you're inviting waves to get much higher up on the beach before they actually dissipate their energy. So you're not gaining much. You have to have new sand. Denmex uh, has been looking at up and down the coast, and Mayor, you mentioned Slaughter Beach and its condition right now. Uh, Kits and Pickering, our uh, beaches on further north, 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 north up in Kent County and Delaware Bay, are actually in far worse condition than even Slaughter Beach. The folks with Slaughter looked at that and they said, well, we shouldn't be asking for much because uh, they're so much worse than we are. Denrec is evaluating uh, truck haul projects to bring, bring some sand in through truck haul, which has been done at Lewis Beach in the past. I think we would go in a position of having add that to the list of, of actions from Denrec. Uh, I think they're opening the bids on that this month, uh, sometime in the next week or two. But then following that uh, extension of the Corps of Engineers uh, project boundary, which currently is about 1,300 feet from the jetty to the east or the south, which puts it about three houses or four houses to the east of the Children's Beach House, excuse me, the um, Yacht Club runner. And it uh, was originally at one point all the way down to the ferry breakwater. That was the study area. So the Corps of Engineers by authority by, by, by congressional authority does not, cannot work outside of their defined project area. And I think we need to correct that. I, I will say, Mayor, that um, at, the, at the meeting we just had a week or so ago, that I have been in contact with uh, the Environment and Public Works Committee uh, as they draft the Water Resource Development Act for 2022. And this is on their plate of things to consider. And I think we'll have some uh, some lively dialogue on that. So basically, I'm looking at a couple of things is, is the immediate action on this storm. I'm looking to work for you on your behalf on developing a, a more stable uh, reaction plan, as, as Nick has talked about, and also to increase the Corps of Engineers' presence on Lewis Beach. So I think that, that summarizes enough. I'm happy to take any questions from anybody. Great, thank you, Tony. I think uh, I think my takeaway from the meeting we had was that the the uh, the, tr the immediate issue is something we need to deal with Denrec on, but the long-term fix is really something that is an Army Corps issue, 
and um, and so we, it's a two-pronged approach that you're proposing, and that and we're very fortunate that under the current uh, federal um, legisl federal federal delegation, we have uh, Senator Coons and Senator Carper, uh, because of their positions in in the Senate, are in a position to be highly influential in in our, our success here, and we have been, you have been, I have been, and I think Khalil has been as well. Uh, in contact with all both both Senator uh, Coons and Senator Carper regarding our concerns, uh, and we have had direct contact with John Kane, who is uh, Senator Carper's uh, uh, primary person on the on the WERTA project. So we are working it, but it, th there are two different tactics here that have to be taken. Am I right in that dis discussion? <coughs> But that's that's absolutely correct. Um, uh, you know, then the the partnership going forward with the Corps of Engineers uh, does require a non-federal participation, <clears throat> and that would be a currently under the current understanding it's at Stenrack alone. But I think that also also opens up that uh, discussion that Senate that uh, Secretary Garvin has talked about over the last couple of years, which is cost sharing into the future and how we meet those needs going into the future. So that's perhaps a third element as the core. If we're successful in getting in a large area of, of cooperation, and I, and I want to make it clear, the, the the push to enlarge the area without again getting into a lot of the detail is that the reconstruction of the jetty on the Lewis side of the inlet, uh, replacing the very deteriorated sheet steel that was there prior to that work in 2005, uh, resulted in a shadow zone against wave attack. Uh, typically and generally in front of the, uh, pretty much in the entire section that is now the uh, uh, the authorized area. Filling it with sand as was done, uh, it, it was very successful. It has been very stable until very recently, this past storm. And that <clears throat> you've put off that that what's called a feeder beach area to, to drive, to have sand available to move to the central stabilized and eventual prorating easternmost portion of the beach, the sand is derived in an area now that's really just outside of the boundary of the Corps' work. So it's logical that the, the work done by them to stabilize the inlet uh, more successfully, which has changed the, the erosion dynamic in that westernmost third, that they are now still fully responsible for addressing the downdrift effects of that jetted inlet. So I think that makes a lot of sense, and that's really what we're trying to do here is address the area that is now the feeder area. Okay. Khalil, do you have a comment? We'll get to you, Nick. Um, Just let, let Khalil go first. Um, Tony, thank you for your proposal and your, and your thoughts. I mean, I, I understand it uh, pretty well. Um, I did want to ask a question uh, on background. Um, so the, the, the third... The, we currently are within a study area from from Lewis from the Lewis Yacht Club, like Iowa or Missouri Avenue. How did that get reduced from the original study area um, that was from the Lewis Yacht Club to the breakwater at the ferry? Do you have any intel on how that actually happened over the years? No, I, I actually, when I was, uh, so I, I worked, so I was at the agency for 38 years and was not involved in some of those discussions. It was happening around me, but I, I didn't know how or why. I spoke with a gentleman named Jeff Gebert, who just retired, retired from the court in this past year. Jeff had about a 40-year history. Jeff was the walking encyclopedia of all Delaware and, and New Jersey projects. And we both scratched our heads and could not determine exactly when and by what measure the project boundaries were truncated to what they are. Um, right. We, li we live with a decision that doesn't know, we don't know why it was done, except that at the time, I say, Cleo, at the time it was envisioned, and then we had, we had been mitigating that feeder beach concept from the jetty to perhaps maybe a thousand feet to the east of the yacht club for years. That's where we, Dead Wreck, were putting sand. We, every time the inlet was dredged, the sand was put on that little section. And we were successful in maintaining a balance, quote unquote, a balance within nature of that beach by that one area. And, and it was probably the reason why, but we don't know what instrument was used to reduce it, except it was mutually agreed upon by both parties. I can't help you with mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. the mechanics of how that happened. Okay. All right. Just curious. Thank you. Before we before we go to uh, Nick's question, is there, is there anyone else who has a question at the table? Okay, Nick. Well, 
Well, first of all, I couldn't think of a better person to uh, discuss uh, coastal uh, preservation and shoreline erosion than Tony Pratt. Um, and I would uh, advise the council and the committee to accept his proposal. With, uh, with all that said, um, the issue, a couple of issues, when I was a kid growing up on Lewis Beach and we had these major storm events, the, um, I guess they were Denrick bulldozers, would um, go out at low tide and actually go out to the sandbar mm -hmm. and push the sand from the sandbar, which is where a lot of the sand is. I think Tony might agree with that. A lot of the sand that, that comes from the beach during these storm events ends up out in front in a sandbar. Uh, another large portion of that sand ends up down at <coughs> Pilot Point, right. as you refer to in your proposal. So the bulldozers would show up and, and push the sand back up, recreate not only the dune, but also the beach. And, and this happened about five years ago. We had a major event. We had a, a three-day nor'easter, and we had about a, not a five-foot cliff, but about an eight-foot cliff all along Lewis Beach. And there was no immediate reaction to that. I think there was a call to the governor. Um, mm -hmm. uh, in fact, it was Dennis Reardon, I believe, who called the governor. And, um, and then the bulldozers appeared uh, probably within um, 48 hours. And once the dune was rebuilt and the, and the angle of the dune was recreated, uh, then we established snow fences, uh, beach grass planting, and that dune has been rebuilt, um, which is now, as Tony referred to, our major line of defense against the next storm. I noticed that the city also puts out snow fences along the public beach, and we have the rope post fences along the rest of Lewis Beach, and I'm curious why, maybe it's the money, why we're not putting snow fences along the dune the entire length of Lewis Beach to help create and build that dune back. And then, and then plant uh, beach grass. So that's, that's number one. Number two, the mitigation portion of it is how to protect the dune itself. And, and I don't know what Tony's views are on riprap or bulkheads, but I know many coastal communities use riprap and bulkhead to in, uh, fortify their dune, and then the sand goes on top of that. So when the major storm does come through, you've got the protection of a, of a, a dune or, I mean, a uh, riprap or a, a bulkhead. And the, and the final comment is, um, well, there's two more. One is the sand bypass system, which uh, I think Tony was implemental in making that happen at the uh, Indian River Inlet, is uh, the thought of moving the sand in front of Pilot Point back to the Lewis Yacht Club and use a, a sand bypass system to restore the sand on the beach that ultimately ends up at Pilot Point anyway after major storms. So that's, that's, that's the, and the last point is uh, Cape Shores. And uh, the same thing regarding the, uh, the, the drift of the sand, it's captured by the ferry jetty in front of Pilot Point. But that captures sand that otherwise would end up at Cape Shores. And Cape Shores has, I believe, a more dramatic problem than Lewis Beach. During major storms, many of the waves come right up to the back doors of some of these homes in Cape Shores. So I don't know what the plan is to rehabilitate or reestablish or protect uh, the homes and the dune and the beach at Cape Shores. Okay. So I'm just curious um, what, what Tony's thoughts are on that. Okay. Tony, do you have, you want to comment or? Sure, sure, you know, I can do that. Um, I'm, I'm, not a, <laughs> I'm not afraid of giving my, my free advice. Um, couple, good points all uh, from Nick. The, um, let's go back to, just for a second, the, the bulldozing of sand off of the sandbars. Um, again, it, it's, it's my understanding, I'm not an engineer, but I've worked around coastal engineers my whole life. You know, those bars provide a, a great form of protection and wave breaking. Uh, and dissipating of energy. So typically, a nearshore kind of push into that material is ill-advised under today's engineering standards. And I'll kind of leave it at that. Um, the, um, the the material that that um, we would probably bring in is, I think, where the benefit has come over the years is the addition of all that additional sand. Um, the the use of of rope and posts rather than sand fencing itself or dune fencing. 
uh, with Denrick's decision after I left the the, op the, uh, the office, I think I understand the rationale, which is, you know, we, we as humans are very pleased to see a deposition right behind a fence. It's very, very measurable. We can look at what is accumulated in a given year. It, without a fence, what's the destiny of that sand that's blowing up out of the beach? There's, there's only a limited amount of, of sand over the years that, that can be blown by the wind. It's not an un, 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 uh, unending source. So if, it, if there's no fence there to trap it where we can see it, it blows up over the face of the dune and is trapped usually by a well-vegetated dune that's trapped by the grass and the grass will then grow up through it. So you have a broader distribution of sand which then gives you just as much, maybe even more, resistance during a storm uh, than having always just free fenced the toe of the dune. We abandoned dune toe fencing in many locations following the big federal projects of the early 2000s. Uh, Fenwick, Bethany and others, we, we, we've gone to a, a mother form where the dune itself as an entire face will grow. If you have X number of yards of sand and you can accumulate directly behind a four foot snow fence and you can see it, that's great. The, that's the very first sacrificial part during the storm. If you grew the entire face of the dune over 50 feet or 100 feet by a foot or foot and a half, that will give you duration during the, the event itself. So that's kind of why Denrec has switched over to uh, a, a demarcation. Don't, 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 don't kill the grass. Don't drag your boats up on the grass. Let's do something to demark this and get, let the dune thrive as sort of a natural system that it was. Uh, bulkheading and, and revetments that are put in dunes are kind of the last strategy of defense. If the dune is working properly, if you have a designed beach uh, system is bar, dry beach, and dune. Uh, the redundancy of a hard structure, you would never want to put it in front of the dune because it's sand sacrifice is what gives you that frictional interface. If you put a wall in front of the dunes, the waves hit that, they bounce off, the next thing you lose right away is the beach. And if you don't have a dry beach in front of your dune, your economy tanks. So generally, we want a system that comprised of a soft dune structure. Uh, there you can bury bulkheading back behind the dune. I don't think we're anywhere near that line of defense to consider at, at this time, but it's always a possibility into the future. Um, the concept of taking sand off of the beach down by Pilot Point has been, has been explored for years. When Jim Johnson was the River and Bay Authority uh, executive director, we approached him, John Hughes and I, my old boss and I approached him about uh, pushing sand, uh, getting sand bypassing it from Pilot Point condominium at the, at the breakwater over to, to Cape Shores, as we talked about. The concept of pumping it back up toward the uh, yacht club is called back, what's called back passing, actually, and you're back, you're passing it back up to its orig origins. An interesting twist on that is that Pilot Point's lease from the city reads, and we explored this, we looked into it very, very carefully. The leasehold that Pilot Point has is to the either mean high water or mean low water mark. It's a tidal mark. So accretion of that beach accretes to their leasehold. So they've got controlling factor over that sand. There was no pallet from Pilot Point to have any of that sand uh, pumped out of their beach area and onto uh, Cape Shores at the time. Uh, John Hughes and I asked the question, this goes back to 20 some years ago. We asked the question, how much further do you need to go to get to the water before it's enough? If you're gaining 11 feet pier, you want 20 more feet, you want 30 more feet, you want 100 more feet, how much more do you need to, to get to have to cross to get to the water line? <clears throat> that question was never answered. I think we asked that question repeatedly over six or seven years and decided to go another route with, with Cape Shores, which is trucking in sand, which was the, um, the at that time, the, the best and reasonable alternative with the idea that uh, we've been through a consulting company down in Florida. There is a plan that, that is is been, been proposed to Cape Shores to nourish their beach from an offshore sand source. It has never been exercised, but kind of that's where it is. I, I, did I hit all your points, Nick? I, I don't know. Did you have any further comment, Nick, at this point? Yeah, I have one more thing. Uh, so, an Antonio, as you know, uh, <coughs> Cape and Lopen is growing as well because of the, the northern drift along the ocean. 
And the inside of the cape, as, as the cape grows, it, it seems like more and more sand accumulating in there, creating the shallows, and that sand otherwise could be used to uh, replenish Cape Shores Beach. So the, the sand bypass system, I think, could work in two different locations to help restore these beaches. Um, regarding the Pilot Point lease, um, I'm pretty good friends with uh, Ed Kingman, who's the president of the Pilot Point uh, Homeowners Association. And I think that there's a possibility, and I only say a possibility, that if there was some sort of a conversation or a meeting about how to procure some of this sand, in front of Pilot Point to restore Lewis Beach, that there might be uh, at least uh, some consideration. Thank you, Nick. All right, well, so where we are with this is Tony's made this proposal, is here for us to discuss today. With that, I think this has been a very good discussion. Uh, we have this on the agenda for the, uh, we will be on the agenda for our December 13th uh, mayor and council consideration. What I would like this committee to, to consider is making a recommendation to council as to whether or not we should proceed with Tony's proposal here. It's just a recommendation to council regarding Tony's proposal. I think, uh, as was said by Nick, uh, <clears throat> you know, Tony is the, the best equipped person in the region to understand, and I, I thank you very much for your time and your expertise this morning in helping to address questions, Tony. Uh, I think, uh, and I know you've been, you know, Blue Speech is unique to some of the other ACT communities because we're just inside the, uh, the ocean, uh, just inside the, the Cape, and so that creates some unique, uh, act, uh, unique circumstances which other beach communities don't, do not face. So if it's the pleasure of this, commission, of this uh, committee to make a recommendation to council, I would appreciate it. I'll make that recommendation. Um, yes, we will. Um, Ted, um, do, do you want that in the form of a motion? Yes, please. Yeah, I, I, I move that we recommend uh, to, to the mayor and council that we favorably look upon, favorably consider um, Tony Pratt's proposal, and of course that's pending. Um, you know, details on the length and and other uh, administrative type things. But uh, I'll second, I second that. that. Great. So we have a second from both uh, Daniel and uh, Chatham. So uh, is there any further discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. No. Aye. Great. So it will now be on the agenda for the 13th for us to consider, assuming the council acts positively on that. Tony uh, will be able to get you started with this proposal uh, PDQ after that, okay? Thank you very much. Yeah. For your, thank you very much for your expertise and your submitting this proposal. I think it really helps, uh, offers some immediate addressing of the concerns that Nick raised at the beginning of this meeting. We look forward to uh, solving the immediate, but more importantly, well, every bit as importantly, I should say, uh, of, of looking for a longer-term solution for the betterment of, of the, the beach community and for the whole town. So uh, that leads us to item six on the agenda, which is the tabletop exercise regarding emergency preparedness. Chuck, you've taken the lead on this and done an excellent job. You want to talk to us about it? Sure. So I have contact, reached out and contacted the Olson Group, which did the tabletop three years ago. Uh, with that tabletop, um, we did a hurricane. Um, Nick, thanks for bringing up some good topic points because you just add to that tabletop. Um, the tabletop is going to be considered uh, a, a storm. Um, I'm not going to get into the specifics because the majority of the people are going to be at that tabletop and playing are the ones at this table. The uh, kind of, we, we met, I met with them by Zoom uh, two days ago. Uh, we went through the tabletop and some of the topics that we wanted to discuss and how the exercise was going to um, proceed. Uh, one of the locations, the biggest one was the location where we're going to have it. Um, we used to have it down at the Dima building, or the Demert building at the end of Powelltown Road. Um, we do now have the uh, Margaret Rollins Center. Um, I was hoping to hopefully have it there. Um, we got three dates in mind, and I need to know by the end of the day what date we want to do. Uh, we have March 9th, 2022. March 16th, 2022, or March 23rd. 
Um, but all three of those days, the Margaret Allen Center is open. Uh, this, the, this tabletop will be an all-day affair. Um, breakfast and lunch will be uh, provided. LRA, don't shoot me now. Um, <laughs> so it, some of the things that we're going to have to look at, and I brought this up before, um, was about these d the dunes and how the, the water comes and possibly break through. And um, if it's okay, uh, we'll discuss this later now, I would like to see Tony at this tabletop. Right, let's, I don't see why we wouldn't invite him. I Tony, uh, if, as soon as I can get you a date, I would like you to be at this tabletop because uh, some of the stuff that's going is came up today is going to be um, on the tabletop and is going to be shown as an issue uh, through a storm pattern, and you could be a good asset. I'd, I'd be happy to do that. I, um, is the tabletop exercise remotely accessible? Because I've, I've had surgery and I'm sitting in a sling here and I can't drive until like January 10th or something like that. I, it's I going to be in March. And I'm, not, I'm not allowed to drive. If I can do it remotely, I'm happy to do it. All right, it, it's going to be in March. So. Hopefully by March you'll be oh, driving. Okay, March will be fine. Right. And if you have a problem driving, I'll come and get you. <laughs> you can have a police escort, Tony. <laughs> you'll have yeah, your own okay. bodyguard for the I've day. I've had that before, but not under the same circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, with this tabletop, we're going to be doing the response, the, the, the preparing for it, the response for it, and the recovery. Um, the preparing stage is, is the most, one of the most important, one of the most important things that we can do, one, to protect our people, uh, protect these citizens, and protect our equipment. Um, if we don't protect any all three of them, we're not we're SOL. So um, it was a hard-driven uh, meeting. We were throwing topics out, throwing ideas out. Um, we are having, we're trying to get the GIS um, people from the county to come back and assist us so we can show the area of flooding um, in the areas of this whole city. Mm -hmm. uh, majority of that uh, picture is right behind, right behind you, Nick. Our screen and, piece. Uh, the screen piece right underneath to the bottom right on my, looking out on the right side there. Um, so that's the... Um, somewhat on the tabletop I don't want to give all the details out because I don't want to give anybody ideas to start thinking of how they're going to do things Mayor. okay um, <laughs> so we're, like I said we're shooting from 8 to 4 um, I need a, if one of us, if we can pick a day um, I, know, I can get this move, moving forward all three dates are open as far as I know, and uh, you've already checked the calendar of the Rollins Center. And all, four, all three of those, that's what I was going I would to suggest that we either look at the 9th or the 23rd, because the National League of Cities Conference is usually the third week, the second week in March. And so you prefer 23rd. the 23rd? Okay. I was too, well. Yeah, planning commission's on the 16th. Okay. So. so if we could, if the 23rd is acceptable, then we'll push it to the 23rd of March. All right. Okay. Also, that needs to be, so we have to get the, um, updated on that. The EOP needs to be updated because they're asking for a copy of that. Okay. So we got to now and then we'll get. We that have done. to have a uh, another uh, meeting meeting to get okay. that. We're going to have a meeting between now and then for sure. Okay. Yeah, Mayor. Um, I should probably mention that we are planning Sea Grants planning uh, in coordination with DEMA uh, to do a workshop potentially the week of March seventh. Um, to mark the 60th anniversary of the storm of 62. Um, and I don't think it'll necessarily fall on the ninth, but I just wanted to mention that there's a possibility. Okay, well, we're, gonna, we're going with the 23rd, so uh, that should leave the, the, third, the 9th of March open. Um, okay. okay. Great. But the 9th is, is something we'll note on our calendar is pending, okay? Thank you. All right. So then I think, uh, thanks again, Chatham. That's a good update. And I appreciate your getting in contact with the Olson Group and nailing down some dates. Uh, 
I do not have a current update from BB, uh, and I know we have Marcy Jack is assigned as the person who's the contact. We need to make sure we reach out and see if that's been. They have actually hired a uh, new coordinator. Okay, so we need to. Do you know the name by uh, chance? So we're Georgetown Police Chief. What's his name? Um, R.L. Hughes. R.L. Hughes. Okay. They sent me an email last week. Okay. If you'll get me his email uh, address. I don't know when he starts. Okay, but if you're, but okay, we can find out. I got it from Marcy. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you. And in terms of NIMS training, I am told by Anne Marie that uh, most of our staff has been responding well to NIMS, and Shelby's not here right now, but I think uh, she's keeping track of all those records. And yes. Do you want to offer anything? I would just offer that we are trying to identify the 300 and 400 level training, and uh, it may need to be scheduled by the employees when it is most convenient for their department. On top of that, I just did the, the yearly NIMS annual report, and it is done. We got a 93%. All right. That's good. All right. I think we need, uh, is there anything else that anyone would like to bring forward before we talk about scheduling our next meeting? I just have a question, and maybe this is something that could be added to the agenda next time, is sort of an update on the project that the city's doing um, with, I think, DEMA and FEMA funds regarding the uh, breach of the berm between Cedar and the canal. You know, we, there was a project to study what? options for that, and I, I haven't heard anything on that in a really long time. Danelle's ready to give you some update. So we're getting close um, to getting the final report. Um, the last couple of months, honestly, it's been in the final report stage process. Um, they finalized all the reporting, uh, the, all the data gathering and everything, and all the GIS work's been completed. So right now we're just um, anticipating the final report in the next month and month and a half so we can then get it to DEMA. So we're getting close to having a report ready to go. Okay, and now that report has some options then for uh, consideration if you apply for additional funding in the future. Correct. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Any other questions? Hearing none, I think we probably should look at February, perhaps, as a knowing that we're going to have this uh, uh, workshop tabletop exercise in uh, March. Uh, looking at February. Uh, how does Groundhog Day sound, everybody? February the second. I'm fine with that. That's the first Wednesday. That's the first Wednesday. Is nine o'clock still a good time for everyone? Okay. So we'll set our next meeting for February second at nine o'clock here. Okay. Any other comments or questions before we move on then? I think this has been a very good discussion this morning. I think uh, I thank you, Tony, for your proposal. I think it's very timely. Uh, and sorry we're faced with this immediate situation, but sometimes uh, those immediate things lead to lots of long-term good ones, and I'm hoping this one will. I know with your expertise, so uh, we'll be added in a, in a good direction. So thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, and Mayor, if I could just add one thing. I, I looked ahead of my calendar. Um, <laughs> I don't have much in the spring, but on March 23rd, I'm supposed to be in D.C. at my ASBPA summit. That is possibly going to change because Congress is not in session that week, which we thought they were going to be. I'm trying to move that date, so it's a tentative for me on the 23rd of March. Well, I'll, I'll catch you up on, on that when I know what I'm doing for sure, but I'm currently supposed to be in D.C. that week. Okay. Well, keep, keep us abreast of that, of any changes that you have as soon as possible. Good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Question again. Yes, Nick. I have one, one last question. Um, I got the yep. who, um, back, um, back to the snow fences on Lewis Beach. Who, who authorizes that and who pays for it and who installs it? And the city, Rick can respond to the, uh, the snow fences on Lewis Beach. You, you, well, Lewis Beach, we put them on. Right. You put them on. Yeah. And the city pays for that? Yes. Yes, we pay for we buy the fence. You, you buy the fence and put it up and then take it. So again, is there any plan to do 
all of Lewis Beach because it is a public beach. There is no current plan that I'm aware of. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, we can certainly look into okay. possibly extending it, but and where it would be, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I mean, what do where it would be in relationship? I mean, the, where you put it now is currently uh, very much in, in a, a consistent pattern that's gone on for probably 10, 15 years or more. It's about the middle of the beach, I think, is right. where, where you Yeah, are. that's where we've been putting it every yeah. year. Now, going down the beach, it depends on Denmark is taken care of, or the fence is up right now, the poles with the... Yeah, who, who, put the road road up? who put the poles and the rope up? Who that's a Denmark. Denmark. Denmark did that? Yes. They did that primarily to help keep people off of the dune and uh, and establish where the grasses would be, where they were trying to uh, get the, allow the grasses to grow. So I, uh, they are they are the ones who have, I believe by now have cleaned up the post and rope that was okay. impacted. I think that the, my request would be either Denmark or the city consider putting the snow fences the whole length of the beach all the way down to the Lewis Yacht Club. We can certainly look into that. That can be one of the things Tony can, helps us consider. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. If there's nothing further, it is uh, looks like 10:07, and we'll consider this meeting adjourned. Thank you all very much. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.